Hi everyone. In the previous lectures, we started with our discussion on the frequency response of MOS amplifiers. We said MOS amplifiers gains start decreasing as a function of frequency as frequency increases. And one of the reasons we said was that uh, there were impedances tend to have capacitances associated with them and capacitances have a tendency to uh, to offer lower impedance as one increases the frequency. And we said therefore because of the presence of capacitors there is a frequency dependent gain. The voltage gain of an amplifier now depends on the frequency of the input signal. Now in the process of studying that we also said I mean largely we were including capacitance at the output or the load terminal. So we said for example if we took a common source amplifier we said generally the load will have not only a resistance but also some associated capacitance with it and we analyzed how the gain looks like for this case. Now what we will show is that if you look at a construction of a MOS device you will end up getting some unintended parasitic capacitances because of the geometry or the structure of your MOS device itself. We will very briefly look at what are those values or just intuitively understand what are those capacitances and what effect does those capacitances have on the frequency response of the single stage MOS amplifiers. To begin with, this is, these are called parasitic capacitors, meaning we don't purposefully design a capacitor by, by design, we don't choose to build capacitors here. These capacitors naturally occur as unwanted capacitors because of the way the MOS device is constructed. Now generally, when does these parasitic capacitors arise? So when you have two conducting metal plates which are separated by a distance d and the in between there is some dielectric then you will have a capacitance associated between these two plates and these are this is a simple parasitic I mean, sorry a parallel plate capacitor so if you dump some charge plus q onto this plate and minus q onto this plate then a potential difference is developed between the two and interestingly the potential difference developed between the two is proportional to the charge Present on, present on the plate and the proportionality constant is what we call capacitance. It tells you how much of potential is developed if you dump a certain amount of charge onto the metal plates. Now this is what we call a linear capacitor meaning if you dump charge on some capacitor or, some, or, or on two parallel plates this way and we monitor the potential developed between the two plates it will increase linearly with the charge. And the slope of this graph dv by dq gives us 1 by c which is what we call the capacitance. Now there are many other sources of capacitance especially when we talk about MOS and BJT circuits. A reverse biased p-n junction diode. If you take a simple p-n junction diode, a reverse biased p-n junction diode can also exhibit a capacitive effect. How does it do that? Again, we should look at the definition of a capacitance. If you have between two terminals, charges separated by a distance, you need to have charges separated by a distance. And as you apply a voltage between the two terminals, the charge should also change. It should increase, most it should increase. It need not be a linear change. It can also be a nonlinear change. Okay, so here what I mean is that if I have two terminals and it's in, it, the, you, the way in which I mean I can associate capacitance with any device is that if you have charges separated, you have this charge separation effect can lead to capacitance. So here if you see here in a parallel plate capacitors, the charge is separated here between the two metal plates. The same way I can think of charges separated in a PN reverse biased PN junction as well. Once you apply a reverse bias, you will have immobile positive ions on the N side and immobile negative ions on the N side, on the P side. Now as you increase the reverse bias voltage, the depletion width will increase, which means the charge will also increase, the depletion charge will also increase. So whenever you have an effect this way, where you, as you increase your voltage across the, the device, the charge stored also increases. Then we can model that effect as a capacitive effect. 
Now the associated capacitance then if you know uh, for example since we have already studied PN junction diodes in the previous semester we can estimate the charge present in this depletion region as a function of voltage then we can differentiate dq by dv and that will give us the capacitance in fact the we will very soon see the equations itself i'll only present the equations and not the derivation we look at it very intuitively c is given by epsilon a upon w where w is your deple depletion width and the depletion width is proportional to root of the reverse voltage plus the built in voltage so as you increase the reverse voltage the depletion width will increase and capacitance will decrease so this is what a, a reverse biased pn junctions capacitance is so it is it occurs because you have charges separated by a distance and the charge varies as you apply uh, as you increase the voltage of between the two terminals as well so therefore it has i we can say that the device has some capacitance associated with it the the pnn regions the bulk pnn regions can be treated as conducting metal plates and in between we can treat this as a dielectric okay so we we don't right now I, i'm not talking about the field distributions how the electric field is distrib distributed in in between and all of that right now we can just say that a reverse bias pn junction is going to offer some capacitance and mind you that capacitance is not a linear capacitance why is it not linear i mean we can see that from the equations at a later stage which was derived in the previous semester capacitance will be proportional inversely proportional to root of voltage so as you increase the voltage capacitance will decrease because depletion width increases so we can see epsilon a by w where epsilon here is the permittivity of silicon okay again uh, these are the th uh, these are the ideas we discussed in last semester uh, the reason why we consider that as epsilon as permittivity of silicon even though they are n and p regions is that when you dope a material it's called as an impurity which means we, we will sometimes add for a million silicon atoms we will add one phosphorus or boron atom so we will assume that the properties of the device have not changed so permittivity and all the properties of the material remain the same so therefore i can consider this as epsilon silicon itself and when we estimate the capacitance this capacitance will have a dependence on voltage so therefore whenever you have a voltage versus charge distribution which is nonlinear so in case of a pn junction diode it's going to increase but it will have some kind of a nonlinear de nonlinear dependence then in that case we will define incremental capacitance so the same way we defined incremental impedance we will define incremental capacitance so for a given reverse voltage we will find what is the incremental capacitance so this is called depletion capacitance c dip c dep or junction capacitance so this is in the reverse bias region we can also similarly define capacitance in forward bias region which is a little bit more involved and uh, but i'll not go into the details but that's called a diffusion capacitance so this is a capacitance that occurs in forward biased pn junctions but in a mos structure we will not encounter forward biased pn junctions only in a bjt we will encounter them so i'll i'll ignore them right now so right now we'll come back to with this knowledge that if you have two conducting regions separated by a distance then we'll end up having a capacitance with that as associated with that or if you have a reverse biased pn junction even that will have offer a capacitance we'll keep these two points in mind and look at what are the possible capacitances that one can encounter in a mos structure shown here is an n channel mos structure now here again we are interested in finding the capacitance in saturation region in the saturation region a channel is already formed and it it is already pinched off towards the drain end now if you see here gate is a metal is a conducting region now this after the channel is formed which means vgs is greater than vt and vds is greater than vgs minus vt and all of that after a channel is formed the i mean after a channel is formed the entire region here becomes a conducting region now here we will end up having a capacitance between gate and channel so i can assume 
the ignoring the channel resistance i can assume all this entire region to be n plus region and the conducting channel region as one single terminal and associated and and i'll call that as source so we are going to have some capacitance associated with gate and source just to give a quick idea now let's assume the channel was continuous if the channel was continuous then that is the channel is continuous throughout the length of the mos in that case we will have a capacitance between gate to channel this is gate and this is channel so if somehow i can call this as a terminal so this is gate to channel the capacitance between gate to channel is given by c ox into w into l w is the width of the channel and l is the area so that's the area of cross section and c ox is the oxide capacitance which is capacitance per unit area so this will be your gate to channel capacitance this is the case if entire channel was a continuous region but in saturation region this is going to be a slightly smaller portion it's going to be channel is pinched off on the drain end so the channel will only be towards the source end in that case in that case you have some part of the channel which is not conducting so what i'm going to say is that i can model that as a capacitance towards the source terminal as cgs as a capacitance between gate and source terminal and this can be this result which i'm going to give you we can be very easily derived and the gate to source capacitance at least i mean it can be derived is given by 2/3 of c ox into w into l this is the gate to source capacitance so we will call it we will lump all the capacitance associated with this channel so here to here so we'll have to integrate it and find the total capacitance associated with that and that will turn out to be 2/3 c ox w l and between gate and drain because drain terminal is now in between there is no conducting region here i can assume there is no capacitance so i get cgd is zero so now we have seen two capacitors because of the construction of this mos structure so between gate to source you have a capacitance of value 2/3 c ox w l this is in saturation region between gate to drain it's zero now there are since mos is a four terminal device there are two other sources of capacitance which is the reverse biased source bulk capacitance and reverse biased drain bulk capacitance so if you see there is a natural pn junction which is formed between the bulk and source and drain regions and since we said for a proper op mosfet operation function or for proper mosfet operation we will always ensure the bulk to be connected to the lowest potential possible so in unipolar system where the, the, sub, the voltage goes from 0 to vdd bulk will typically typically be connected to 0 volts so your source and the drain voltages both of them will tend to be greater than the bulk voltages so which means these two diodes are always reverse biased so you will end up getting two capacitances between source to bulk and drain to bulk so totally we will look at the structure in 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 a few more moments i'll show it in the mos device itself you will end up getting four capacitances so you'll have cgs between gate to source cgd between gate to drain cdb between drain to bulk this is a pn junction capacitance and csb is also a, a source to bulk junction capacitance so both of them are reverse biased pn junction capacitance now cgs is because of the gate gate to channel capacitance so this will be 2/3 of c ox wl cgd is zero but in reality what would happen is that when we try to fabricate a mos device so when when we create this diffusion pockets n plus diffusion pockets on the source and drain sides they will they will actually penetrate a bit under the channel as well so we can say that the gate and drain diffusion regions will have some overlapping capacitance associated with the gate terminal so here this is a conducting region and this is also a conducting region so you have two conducting regions separated by a dielectric which is silicon dioxide here and here also we have the same same way we have between gate and source also we have in addition to the channel capacitance gate to channel capacitance there is also an overlap capacitance so that's what i have shown here pictorially so here you have the drain terminal and the source and source and the drain terminals source and the drain diffusion regions extend a bit under the channel 
So let L O V be the overlap length. L O V, and I'm assuming it's equal on both sorts and drain ends. Now the total gate length, gate length is the length of the gate metal, that is L. Now your channel length is going to be lesser than that because a part of it is eaten away by the N plus diffusion regions. So the L effective, I'm going to call that as the effective channel length, that's going to be L minus 2 L over drive, L overlap. So your CGS, now I'm going to add the extra capacitance, which I'm going to call it as C overlap, the overlap capacitance given by C ox into, because it's the same metal and but it's, it's, it's between the metal and the conducting drain region. So I'm using C ox into W into L overlap. This will be your C overlap. So I'll just add the C overlap to the gate, gate to source capacitance, already existing gate to source capacitance and also to the gate to drain capacitance. So your gate to drain capacitance CGD will no longer be zero, but it will be C ox W into L overlap. And gate to source capacitance will now be two thirds C ox W instead of L, it will be L effective plus C ox W into L overlap. This will be the overlap, overall gate to source and gate to drain capacitors. Okay. So that's what I've shown here. These are the four capacitors and okay. So just to mention one point here, that is how do we estimate? So we have spoken about estimating the gate to source and gate to drain capacitors. How does one estimate the drain to bulk and source to bulk capacitors? Now remember the drain to bulk and source to bulk capacitors are PN junction capacitors. For a PN junction capacitor, the junction capacitance is given by epsilon. You can treat it like a parallel plate capacitor. Epsilon here is silicon, silicon's permittivity, epsilon A upon A being the area of cross section. So that is something you will know if you know the diffusion length and all of that. Divided by W will give you the junction capacitance. The important thing to understand here is that the junction capacitance is inversely proportional to 1 by the reverse bias voltage, root of V built in plus VR. For example, in a MOSFET, VR can either be VSB, the source to bulk voltage, or VDB, the drain to bulk DC voltage. From this, I can say CJ into root of V built in plus VR is a constant. So if I want to find the junction capacitance at any given reverse voltage, and say we know what is the junction capacitance at zero applied reverse voltage. So VR equal to zero, I'm going to call it as CJ naught as the junction capacitance then Cj into root of V built in plus Vr should be equal to Cj naught into root of V built in. So Cj naught is the associated capacitance when there is zero applied bias. So from this, I can calculate the junction capacitance for any applied reverse voltage with the knowledge of the junction capacitance for zero applied bias. The important thing to know, notice here is that junction capacitance here is a very strong function of the, I mean, is a, is, it depends on the reverse voltage applied across it. Now, because this is a capacitance which value itself changes with the reverse voltage applied across it, we call this a variable capacitor or varactor. Now, varactors often find applications in radio frequency circuits where we, we may want to tune a circuit, we may, we may want to change a center frequency of a circuit and in those applications, varactors find great use. So that's it. We are very briefly, we looked at what are the sources of capacitors in a MOS device. We did not even look at the physics of them. Very briefly, we looked at intuitively what are the sources of capacitors and what are the expressions for them. So here I've shown it on the MOS symbol. So totally we have four capacitors between gate to source, gate to drain and source to bulk and drain to bulk. And we saw how to estimate the four capacitors. Uh, I mean, source to bulk and drain to bulk are junction capacitors. So that will involve a little bit of complex math. I mean, very little bit of math, but gate to source and gate to drain capacitors can be very easily calculated with the knowledge of oxide capacitance and the overlap and the effective lengths. So now we will look at what effect will these capacitors have on the frequency response of MOS amplifiers. So this is a four terminal MOS structure and we are showing all the four capacitors associated in it. CGS between gate to source, CGD between gate to drain, CDB and CSB between 
drain and source and bulk terminals. So first I'll start with a, a common source amplifier. So this is an amplifier we have already analyzed and we saw how to find poles and zeros for an amplifier given this uh, for an amplifier given here shown here. Now first very quickly I will write an expression for the gain of this amplifier in the absence of RS. So I will assume I am driving this amplifier directly with an ideal voltage source. If RS is 0, we discussed about procedures for finding voltage gain for an amplifier like this. I said first step estimate the DC gain. When you are estimating DC gain open circuit all capacitors. If you open circuit all capacitors the circuit reduces to something like this. So you have RL and the device. Now to find the gain, the gain is simply given by minus of gm into rl, that is the dc gain. Now after the dc gain, we will quickly estimate the zeros and poles. Now here if you see, you have a gate to drain capacitance between input and output terminals. So we discussed in the last class, whenever you have two paths to the output, one is through gmvi, one is through capacitance, we are going to have a zero. We already discussed how to find this, we said short circuit the output node, find short circuit transconductance and from there we can calculate the zero. So this is something I have already discussed in the previous lecture, you can refer to that. You will get a right of plane zero in the circuit. If you find, if you short circuit this node and calculate the short circuit transconductance, we will get minus of gm into 1 minus s cgd by gm. That is your short circuit transconductance. Multiply this with the output resistance. So remember when you are measuring the output resistance, you should short circuit the input. The moment you short circuit the input, CGD will come in parallel with CL. So you will have RL and CGD and CL in parallel. So the, if the impedance of this network is given by RL upon 1 plus S RL into CGD plus CL. Now if you see this circuit here, I have actually, I have not spoken about what are the capacitances in the MOS amplifier and what impact do they have. So I will have CGS which is gate to source capacitance here between gate and source. I have not shown CSB here because both the voltages are at AC ground, both uh, the voltages across CSB at AC ground. So this capacitor will not matter. And I have absorbed the drain to bulk capacitance CDB into the load capacitance. So I have absorbed the drain to bulk into the load capacitance. Now we will look at the expression and see what effect all these capacitors have on this amplifier structure. Now since you are directly driving to the voltage source, the voltage across CGS is always fixed. It is always equal to VI. It does not take any extra time to charge this capacitor because you are applying the voltage directly. The voltage will take care of charging it. It will provide whatever uh, current the capacitor demands. It will provide it and it will instantaneously charge that capacitor. So CGS really does not figure in this expression if you drive it with a ideal voltage source with zero source resistance. Now if you see, look at looking at this expression, I have rewritten re re it here, you can see in the absence of CGD, if there was no CGD, which is what we have analyzed previously, we had a pole at 1 by RLCL. But now the presence of CGD, it has introduced a right of plane zero because it has introduced a path between input and output. So there is a direct path between input and output. So it has introduced a right of plane 0. And it has also slightly decreased the location of the pole. Previously it was at 1 by RLCL. Now the total load capacitance of the output terminal has increased. So it has slightly pushed the pole inward. So it has slightly decreased the pole frequency. So that is the change CGD brings in. Now we will slightly complicate it and assume CGS is also present but with a source resistance. I am sorry, even in the previous example we assumed CGS but CGS had no effect. But now if I add a source resistance and try to analyze the circuit, we will see how to, how to proceed with that. Now the moment you add a source resistance, this voltage source, if I mean for, for this voltage source, I mean for, for us to expect an output, meaningful output voltage which depends on the input voltage, we have to first charge this capacitance. CGS has to be charged, the input node has to be first charged. Once that node is charged, VGS will be developed. Once VGS is developed, a current will develop in the MOS device. 
this current will again take some time to charge the output node so there are two nodes so we should expect there there are some kind of charging that happening that happens in both the nodes now the question is if you want to derive this equation for this circuit we have to go the brute force way because uh, we have a cgd in between so we'll have to find i mean we can also find the short circuit transconductance and the output resistance but all of that is going to lead to lengthy results it's going to require us to go through a lot of algebra so whenever the 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 computations become more complicated we always said that we resort to simulation softwares the goal of an analog design engineer is to quickly derive some intuitive methods of analyzing a circuit so that the rest of the, the more accurate or a fine tuning can normally always be done on a simulation software but the initial guesswork and the initial estimate will be more or less done by the hand analysis can we come up with some simpler analysis of the circuit now i'll show a simplified version so that is there is no cgd if let's say there was no cgd and i had two capacitors c1 and c2 we'll see how to analyze this circuit to analyze this circuit i'll first go step by step so first i'll find the voltage vgs here now from here to here we know how to analyze it quickly now the interesting thing to note here is that vi has to charge only c1 fully so there is no other current that is leaking away from the circuit so i don't have to worry about any other component so i can analyze this circuit separately and i can analyze this circuit separately because between the two circuits the impedance is infinity looking in impedance is infinity so there is no loading effect so this this stage does not load this stage so i can analyze this separately and then this separately the first circuit is a simple low pass rc circuit so if you have a rc circuit then the transfer function we have already derived this how to derive a pole for a low pass rc circuit it is given by 1 by 1 plus src so that's the transfer function from so vgs by vi is given by 1 by 1 plus src the next step is to find v not by vgs v not by vgs is simply v not by vgs is the gain from gate terminal to the output terminal that will be minus of gm which is its short circuit transconductance multiplied by r out it will be gm rl by 1 plus scl rl this is the expression multiply these two you get the overall gain and you get this overall gain here now this is a much simpler analysis so all i need to do is find the pole at the input separately output separately and i already have an idea how many poles the system contains it contains two poles and roughly i have an idea how the frequency response looks like so the analysis becomes much simpler if there is no cgd if there is no capacitance between input and output so the next goal is is it possible then to reduce this circuit at least conceptually to a circuit like this can we reduce this circuit to a circuit of this form then the analysis is much simpler fortunately the answer to this question is yes so to do that i'll first quickly discuss a theorem called the miller's theorem so now let's assume i'll i'll probably discuss the intuition behind a miller's theorem in the next class i'll give you an intuitive explanation for it but right now i'll just quickly tell you what the theorem is now let's say we have an impedance z connected between two voltages two terminals so the input terminal i'm going to call it as va so there is some common terminal and this is input terminal and this second terminal i'm going to call it as v2 or some let or let me use v out here v out as the second terminal now it is given that v out and v in are dependent voltages meaning the output voltage between these two terminals is given by some gain times some a times vi it's given by a times vi now this impedance z can be represented this way so that is this impedance can be split as two impedances and represented as two impedances as seen by the input and the output okay that's that's what miller's theorem is now what are those two impedances we'll try to calculate it so remember when we apply miller's theorem all these theorems the terminal behavior remains the same as far as the input is concerned the current drawn from the input and the voltage at the input terminal will remain the same and similarly same holds true for the output as well 
So first we'll calculate what is the impedance seen at the input terminal. So VI, II is the current here. The voltage across the impedance Z, the one terminal voltage is VI. The other terminal's voltage is A times VI. So the voltage across the impedance Z is 1 minus A times VI. A here is the voltage gain, ratio of the output voltage V0 by VI. So the current drawn into the impedance Z is 1 minus A times VI divided by Z. So this is the current II. Now VI by II is what we call the input impedance. So that is the impedance that is perceived between these two terminals. So that is given by Z by 1 minus A. So that is the input impedance. Similarly, I can calculate what is the output impedance. So that is the impedance perceived by this dependent source. So that dependent source we already know the current, so we already know the current. So I'll I'll call. So in the same way, I'll try to find out. I I know the voltage between the terminals, so which is A times V I, and let this current drawn from that be I X. So I need to find this ratio A times V I by I X is what I need to find. Now if you look at the circuit, I X is simply minus I I. So I X is the current flowing in this direction. It is simply minus I I. So this will be. The ratio will be A times VI upon IX, so which will be minus II. And we already know this ratio of VI by II from here. So I'll replace it as minus of A upon minus of A into Z by 1 minus A. So this can then be written. So this is your impedance seen at the output terminal. So if I take A, A to the denominator, I'll get Z by 1 minus 1 by A. So that's what I have shown here. As far as the output is concerned, it's going to perceive an impedance of Z by 1 minus 1 by A. And as far as the input is concerned, it's going to see an impedance of Z by 1 minus A. Now what I have done here is that effectively, I have split this impedance as two unrelated impedances and as two impedances, non-interacting impedances. So I have the node here, this node and this node were previously interacting nodes. There was some current directly flowing between the two. But now, by using this transformation, I have decoupled, I have decoupled these two nodes. So I have made them as two non-interacting nodes. Of course, there is some voltage dependence and all that, but there is no direct current, at least in the model that we have shown here, there is no direct current in the between the two nodes. So this effect, this theorem is called Miller's theorem to splitting this impedance Z to two different impedances at the input and the output terminals. So splitting an impedance which is running between two nodes. Two nodes. We split them as two impedances seen by those individual nodes. This is called the Miller's theorem. Now we are going to apply Miller's theorem to a common source amplifier. Now first if you look at this here, I will call this node as Vi and the output node voltage as V0. We already know that for the time being, we'll assume this is for lower frequencies. We know that V0 by VI is A. The gain of this amplifier is minus, minus of GM times RL. So this is the low frequency gain. I'm going to assume that. So then this capacitance, so I'll, I'll, I've shown a capacitance here between two node voltages. So let's the node voltage V2 be some value minus a. I'm using minus here so that that's what you will see in common source amplifiers. Okay. Or, or probably I can retain the sign. Let me just retain the sign. It will be a times v1. So if I have a capacitance between two terminals v1 and v2 and these ter terminal voltages v2 by v1 is related by an equation v2 by v v1 equal to a. So which means v2 is some amplified version of v1 then I can split this capacitance as two capacitors. One at the input terminal and the other one at the output terminal. The value of this capacitance can be found from Miller's theorem. The impedance of capacitance is 1 by SC. So at the input, you will see a capacitance of Z by 1 minus A. So 1 by SC divided by 1 minus A. At the output, you will see a capacitance of Z which is 1 by SC into 1 minus 1 by A. So as far as the circuit is concerned, when you are looking at the circuit from V1, it will look like a capacitance of value, if you see this equation, C into 1 minus A. 
and at the output it's going to look like a capacitance of value c into 1 minus 1 by a okay now i'll use these expressions and try to analyze this circuit here so i'm going to take cgd and split cgd as two capacitors so i'm going to remove this and split it as two capacitors one at the output terminal other one at the uh, one at the input terminal other one at the output terminal so this at the input terminal the capacitance is given by cgd into 1 minus a a here is your gain of this amplifier which is minus gmrl so it will look like a really large capacitance of value cgd into 1 plus gmrl even though cgd is a very small capacitance it will look like an amplified version at the input terminal because of this miller's theorem and at the output it's going to be cgd into 1 plus 1 by gmrl because a here is minus 1 minus gmrl so using this equation i get cgd as cgd into 1 plus 1 by gmrl so now i'll use this and try to analyze the circuit i'm going to call all the capacitances at the input as c1 so here c1 is cgs plus cgd into 1 plus gm rs rl that's the input capacitance and the load capacitance cl um, at, at, at total output capacitance i'm going to call it c2 as c2 is cl plus cgd into 1 plus 1 by gm rl okay it's going to look like a really large capacitance at the input so we just discussed when we were discussing the parasitic capacitors we said cgd is a very small value it only depends upon the overlap so for long channel mosfets it really will be much smaller cgs will be much greater than cgd but for short channel mosfets CO, cgd can be a significant fraction of the total capacitance the problem is even though cgd is a small capacitance in a common source amplifier because it is between two high gain points it happens to be between two high gain points at the input it's going to look like a really large capacitance a multiplied version of this cgd this large capacitance we will see we will very quickly see what effect does it cause to the amplified frequency response so i have already analyzed this circuit here with a finite source resistance and c1 and c2 i'll directly write the pole ex the expression for that is minus of gm rl is your dc gain even though rs is present the dc gain will not depend on rs because input impedance is infinity at dc that divided by 1 plus s rs c1 into 1 plus s c2 rl these are the two pole locations now previously for a common source amplifier when there was no when there was no cgd or cgs also i'll assume even cgs is a very small number so when there was no cgd what we were seeing is the graph that is shown here the pole there was only one major pole at the output of course because of cgs i can have some capacitance and i'll have a input pole whose value will be 1 by rs into cgs but this i'm assuming to be very small very high so i'll ignore this for the time being okay so remember what i'm trying to say is this, say is that in this value c1 cgs is a very small value because let's assume gmrl is 1000 so then the cgd is going to get multiplied by 1000 times that's a huge multiplication factor so this term can be significant because of miller multiplication or miller theorem so what i've shown here is the frequency response graph for the amplifier in the absence of cgd it has only one pole which will occur at 1 by rlcl now the thing with the moment we introduce cgd this amplifier is going to end up having two poles one at the input and one at the output and we said most of these amplifiers are used for amplifying small voltage signals for example signals from a microphone which will have very low power delivering capacity which means the source resistance will be very high in that case rs if since rs is very high i'm going to assume that rs the pole formed there are two poles here one is 1 by rs into c1 the other pole is 1 by rl into c2 i'm going to assume rs into c1 comes first so that frequency response graph will look like this then when it reaches rlcl again you will encounter another pole 
So now this slope will be minus 20 decibels per decade. After the second pole, it will be minus 40 decibels per decade. So if you see here, the gain decreases significantly as compared to at higher frequencies as, as compared to the case when CGD was absent. Okay, so I can say I will introduce another term called dominant pole. Whenever you have a system comprising of many poles, you have more than one pole and it turns out that one pole out of them happens to be at the lowest frequency compared to all the other poles, then that pole will dictate the overall performance of the system itself. It's like a relay race. So if you have n players running equal distances, then the player who is the slowest is going to dictate, he's going to serve as the bottleneck for the entire, uh, for, the, for the success of the entire race. Okay, so same way, the pole, the lowest frequency pole will serve as the bottleneck for the system. That will, that will dictate the bandwidth. So that's why the lowest frequency pole is often called the dominant pole. That's going to dominate the response of the system. So this pole here, 1 by Rs into C1, which I'm going to expand C1, which is nothing but CGS plus CGD into 1 plus GM RL is what we call the dominant pole in the system. Because of Miller, Miller, F, Miller's theorem, we are seeing a really large capacitance of the input because of which a low frequency pole is cre created in the input. The problem with the low frequency pole is that now it reduces the bandwidth of the system. Previously, the range, useful range where the amplifier could amplify was much larger. Now, because of this pole C1, the, the input pole, the bandwidth of the amplifier decreases. The range of frequencies for which the amplifier's gain is constant, starting from DC, reduces. Okay, that's the major problem with this. Now, this effect, this effect of the capacitance CGD getting multiplied by a huge factor, it's called Miller effect. Okay, so this effect is called Miller effect, where the capacitance is going to get multiplied as a huge capacitance, uh, multiplied by huge gain, and it's going to appear as a large capacitance of the input. Okay, so this effect is what we call the Miller effect, because it's a consequence of Miller's theorem. So it's called the Miller effect. The problem that Miller effect causes in common source amplifiers is that it decreases the bandwidth of the system, especially when you have a finite source resistance. It decreases the bandwidth of the system. It creates more poles, of course, but it decreases the bandwidth of the system. So it makes the frequency response worse. Now I'll stop at this point. We will later see how to make this better. Okay, thank you.